The forms of realism that interest me involve a serious representation of social worlds, the people who make them and the transformations they are going through. Thinking about realisms in museum context has so far proved fruitful to me because museums offer excellent sites to explore ways of narrating and dramatizing diverse histories and ways of translating across cultures. And since they are performative contexts, museums keep us acutely aware of different audiences for the stories we tell. Realism as I conceive it is obviously not reducible to empiricism and it's not the philosopher's realism, an epistemological argument about whether and how much we can know something, anything outside our symbolic and cognitive structures. The forms of realism that interest me involve a serious representation of social worlds, the people who make them and the transformations they are going through. This is not, needless to say, a realism of origins and essences. It doesn't produce frozen diorama-like images of alterity. To work as a historian or an ethnologist, or indeed as a maker of coherent narratives in a museum exhibition, one relies on forms of representation that tend to be associated with literature rather than with natural science. The realist novel offer, offers a good uh, example with its ability to render richly detailed, multi-perspectival accounts of social situations, complex human dilemmas, and changing times. Thinking about realism in museums, I found myself wondering how those quote, iconic objects and peoples, which are often featured in exhibitions uh, or on posters, can be made to express this kind of complex historicity. I'm not sure how. The idea of a masterpiece, sometimes associated with them, doesn't help. There's little room there for contradiction or paradox. A more complex, variegated realism would be needed to represent a world now inescapably fissured by region, gender, by race and ethnicity, by decolonial and neocolonial pressures. This is a photo of Alfred Russell Wallace, the anthropologist explorer, uh, together with the ghost of his mother. Uh, it was photographed by Frederick Hudson um, under the influence of the medium, the spiritual medium, Mrs. Guppy. Um, and uh, together, they managed to make some of the memories of the people they worked with in seances come true, make them real in a way. Um, uh, and uh, Hudson obviously did this by something that you, we now can identify as double exposure. Uh, but uh, interestingly enough, that double exposure is clearly something that for some people in this situation at least was real. This kind of modern magic, uh, because clearly photography is modern magic, right? Whether it's spirit photography or not. Uh, this kind of modern magic always had this double side to it, this sense that there is not just one reality but at least two that we need to uh, consider and unravel. And I think Jim has just told us a lot about how uh, positive that can be, that sense of not looking at just one thing, but having to consider that complexity. One of the things that also strikes me about the magical side of the exhibitionary complex uh, is the strange paradox that uh, exhibitions usually very often work with stuff that can make anything. In this case, this is the Columbian exhibition in Chicago, 1993, it is plaster. Plaster was used to recreate the Paris of the Belle Epoque, which was, according to the Chicago uh, exhibition masters at the time, with the possible exception of Louis Sullivan, uh, the exhibition masters thought that that was the epitome of art and culture. And therefore, it had to be replicated in its entirety. And uh, you know, if you realize how enormously large these grounds were, <laughs> how much plaster was needed to build all those buildings, uh, you can get a sense of the extent of the magic that was being made there. 
uh, to it, it, even for a temporary uh, exhibition, right? It was destroyed after uh, the uh, exhibition was held. I will answer to James' notion of a decentered West and magical realism understood as juxtaposition of different times and a historicization of those junctures as such. Even the real objects that are on display here <laughs> are not being seen as real objects, but they are seen as reflections of those objects. The whole di diorama in itself is a Fata Morgana, and it has been designed uh, as such. It's almost surreal, I would say. We see no objects, no people, just a reflection, and that is what we see. It's surreal as a technique, but it's also surreal in my experience because of its complete disengagement with the present. For me, what is very important in this discussion is that we always have to be aware what happens outside of the ethnographic museum, that we really need a critical engagement with what's going on somewhere else in the world, and not just try to get everything in order in our own society. But of course it's crucial to uh, realize that photography uh, was invented and commercialized just in a few years in that mid-19th century period. That was a very fast uh, development and painters uh, therefore had to rethink their way of looking at the reality. Photography was important to the painters. This is Victorine Meuron, one of his favorite models. But how realistic is the painting he made of her? How realistic are these paintings? I think comparing the photograph with the painting, you can clearly see differences. Although that style of painting was labeled re re realistic, you can really question these kind of labels at the, also at that time. The same goes, for, of course, for impressionist painting, very well known, but how impressionist was it, actually? Already in the 60s and the 70s, people like Gerbans and Koyman set the tone for a much more dynamic approach in research and in presentations. If we want to characterize their approaches to museum presentations in the broad sense, we can say that both curators tend to create an atmosphere of realism in their exhibitions. First Gerbans with his use of photography and film, particularly in the 1960s, and later Simon Koyman with his attempts to recreate the local atmosphere in an exhibition on bark cloth in Oceania. The general style for exhibition, styles for exhibition making were, first of all, we said, you can make aesthetic exhibitions. The second uh, style of exhibition making, as we recognized it, was thematic. And I think that also speaks rather for itself. But the third one, not unimportant, was evocative to create an atmosphere and a kind of sense of realism. I cannot recall, but that's my memory, uh, anyone using the term realism. But I do recall curators saying that the displays they made were meant to evoke a certain atmosphere and a kind of impression of a local sphere. 